Right, good morning. Good morning and welcome. Um, I'm Simon Less, and I head the Environment and Energy Unit at the Fox Exchange. And welcome to Keeping the Lights On, Energy of the 2010s. Um, now, over the next decade, there is going to be uh, a lot of change in the energy sector. Most of the coal generation, most of the nuclear generation will retire in this country over the next 10 to 15 years. And at the same time, the proportion of our gas coming from the North Sea will be declining rapidly. So what do these trends mean for our security supply? And we can't, we can't consider this question without also considering our goals on carbon. We have challenging targets for the end of this decade, targets on carbon reduction itself and targets on um, renewable generation. So what are the roles for and the implications of new renewables, new uh, nuclear and new gas? So lots of questions. I think this is, a, this is a good time to be discussing these issues because we know that the government is currently considering energy market reform and will be bringing out a consultation this autumn. Um, so I'm very grateful to Oil and Gas UK for sponsoring um, this event, and I'm delighted to welcome three distinguished speakers. Um, we have Andrew George, MP, David Odling from Oil and Gas UK, and Doug Parr from Greenpeace. Unfortunately, our fourth speaker, Ila Kilbaindor from AEA Group, um, is ill and uh, sends his apologies. Um, so um, we're going to have to ask each of the three speakers to speak. Um, briefly, and then I suggest that we have questions and discussions once we've been through all three speakers. So I'm going to start with Andrew George, who is MP for West Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly since 1997, and he's recently taken up the role as team leader for the Liberal Democrat Parliamentary Party covering both debt and death row. Right, I'll, I'll stand, uh, that's all right. And, um, um, as someone who, um, Simon says, I'm, I'm um, relatively new to the, the role as team, team leader in a in in two well covering two government departments, um, DEC and, and, and DEFRA. One in which we we have um, well that we should have reasonable influence, and in we we have uh, as a party the position of Secretary of State and Chris Chris Hume. Um, and also, as a result of that, therefore, therefore, special advisors um, who have um, party links, which is quite normal um, in, in, the, in these circumstances, as opposed to DEFRA, uh, where we have no ministerial presence at all, and therefore, it's inevitable that my my role tends to be drawn more in the direction of DEFRA than, than DEC. It doesn't mean to say that that, that DEC is any is any um, less important to our, to us. It just means that. Um, naturally, uh, um, we'll be following the, the line of the, the line of the area where there's the greatest amount of work for us to to do as a backbench um, um, team. Um, in respect of the question which has been uh, raised, uh, I suppose the first the first response of any of any self you know, or rather respectable um, political party is to do our best to to blame our predecessors as much as possible. And, um, we can certainly do that. There's plenty of opportunity to do to do that in the in the sense that we have um, uh, the pre the predecessor government left uh, I think a number of issues of unresolved until very late in the day <coughs> in relation to to their position on on, uh, on nuclear nuclear replacement and and also renewables, which has left us significantly behind the rest of Europe. I think we're the third worst. Country as far as as far as development of, of, of renewables, and renewables as, as, a, as a source, as a portion of the overall source of power in, in this in this country, and the prospects for the development of, of renewables, whilst there are some encouraging signs, certainly we're starting to a long way behind uh, many other countries um, in Europe, let alone the rest the rest of the world. So there's a tremendous amount of work to be to be done there. The um, the, the the annual energy statement, and certainly the, the, the statement which is brought out um, in the summer in terms of the, the future prospects for, for the industry, and the 
painted a number of scenarios, which uh, I'm sure, I'm sure that um, later we want to expand upon a little later on, because it certainly you know, generates some question marks about the, the role, the future role of, uh, uh, of oil, and especially gas, and and and, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out. Obviously, the big big question about the effectiveness of, uh, of, of, of carbon capture and storage. And if, that, if that does uh, prove itself to provide uh, a significant route to, to resolving a lot of the energy problems for the, for the future, I think that the, um, the department, Chris Hume, has I think, made it quite clear that he's very, he's very enthusiastic to support that providing Providing that, 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 uh, that it is is based on sound sound evidence, that it is an effective effective methodology. Um, we're also left, of course, with a legacy not just of the previous government, but of cases uh, of, <coughs> of, of two parties over the last 15 years in relation to to, to nuclear, which has left us with a with, with a legacy um, which we are determined. We will not agree to that is to, to leave the public sector um, with the headache of a massive debt uh, to be paid um, from the taxpayer uh, to meet the need for, for decommissioning and cleaning up um, the waste which has been left by, by uh, a policy which I don't think really thought through the consequence, you know, its, its consequences, nor the cost of decommissioning, nor in the design of the uh, of the plants themselves um, actually designed in into those into those plants any any thought about how how they would be dismantled and, and, de and decommissioned when they came to the end of their useful life. For example, as I'm sure you all already know that of the 3.2 billion pound budget which which DEC has, 1.8 billion pounds of that of that budget um, is already committed uh, to to meeting the costs of, of, of uh, decommission, the legacy which has been left us by, by our predecessors. Um, in fact, I think Christine has said on, on a number of occasions already that he was thinking of renaming the department, the, department the, the nuclear legacy department, with a little bit else added on, because that, that because more than half of the, of the budget um, uh, of his department is already committed, and we can do nothing about that. Um, so, so. Uh, I mean, in answer to the question, will the lights remain on? Well, I've always remained confident that, um, that we Brits are very good at finding a way forward. <laughs> it's just that I'd rather than we were doing it because well, I, I was often perhaps using Cornish terminology with a, with a bit of a last minute lash up. Um, that's the last thing we should be doing. We should go and call it a clear, a clear, clear strategy. The legacy is not, is not a good one. Um, turning things around sure that we actually have a decent um, uh, plan for, for resolving these issues into the future is going to be a very, a very significant challenge. And I certainly hope that we won't be dependent upon, upon importing, uh, in solely independent or largely uh, dependent on importing energy, including electricity, from, uh, from other uh, neighboring countries because of our own failed strategy in, in this country. I know that, you know, that Chris is very committed that's the piece so thank you. Thank you, Jim. Now I'm very pleased to introduce David Odling, who is Energy Policy Manager at Oil and Gas UK. Um, he joined the organisation as Assistant Director of Policy um, after a career in the oil and gas industry since 1977. Thank you, sir. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> The government has got three overarching objectives with energy policy, and these are uh, replicated in Europe. To reduce emissions, to secure supplies, and to make it all affordable in order to keep the economy competitive, and stop people going into fuel poverty. All very laudable. The trouble is, of course, one can well imagine there are considerable tensions between those three strands of policy. And there's a huge amount been done and talked about in recent years uh, about reducing emissions to tackle climate change, that's on. Uh, but in our view, 
uh, it's rather taking the eye off the other two, which is keeping the lights on, as the title of this uh, session, and, crucially, the question of affordability. And when you examine DEC's more recent publication called The 2050 Pathways, it came out in July, which is, if you like, their attempt to, to detail more clearly how they see us moving from here to there, um, it, 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 it illuminates quite a lot of things, but it leaves an awful lot of things very much up in the air, or very much uh, in the hands, almost, you'd say, of the gods, not quite, that's a slight exaggeration, but uh, those kind of doubts that make you think, how on earth is this going to be delivered? And, of course, we also have legally binding uh, uh, targets wrapped into all of this. Um, some of them come from an EU level, some of them come from our own domestic legislation. Well, the EU level, we've got, amazingly, 20% reduction in emissions plus 20% renewable energy, plus 20% gain in energy efficiency, all to be done by 2020. A remarkable series of 20s, which doesn't sort of sound too scientific or uh, 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 well thought out. Now, the 20% reduction in emissions, I think we can all understand. Um, the 20% renewables target, you begin to say, hmm, firstly, that's quite a stretch. This is Europe as a whole. Secondly, surely the objective action should be to reduce emissions if that's what you want to do, not necessarily to determine the direction that you specifically take in order to reduce emissions, i.e. the means of getting there. And 20% energy efficiency, interestingly, we hardly hear anything about that target these days, because I don't think anybody knows how to measure it properly. And it's not sure what the baseline is. But clearly, energy efficiency improvement actually are hugely important and we can all identify with that particularly in buildings uh, um, and so on so there's all that below that at national level we've got this overall objective of an 80 percent reduction in emissions by 2050 the starting point by the way for these reduction emissions is 1990 that's the, the measuring point um, and then we've got a series of policies to implement this we've got eu emissions trading scheme we've got our own car uh, CC levy, we've got our own CC of climate change agreements, we've got uh, 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 ROCs, renewable obligation certificates, we're about to get FITs, feed-in tariffs, uh, uh, there's a new one that's just started called the CRC Energy Efficiency Scheme, it's on its third name and it hasn't even begun yet. Um, we're about to get the renewable heat incentives, so we get all this jumble of stuff intertwined Every one of them implies a different price for carbon, um, which actually makes it very difficult for investors to know what to do. Now, at the moment, if we go back to the renewables, the main means of delivering that renewable target is wind power, because that's the only technology which is currently available on the scale that we're talking about. And that means a massive expansion in wind power talking about going from roughly capacity of four and a half thousand megawatts of install capacity, you know, a megawatt is a million watts, most electricity is counted in megawatts at a big scale, four and a half thousand to something over 30,000 in the space of 10 years, 11 years. That is a simply stupendous expansion, which requires gargantuan sums of money and it also requires a very large supply chain. We question whether it can be done. We seriously question whether we can done. We think it's noble and laudable, but we think it is very ambitious, and we think that it is going to be incredibly expensive. It'd be much better if that was spread out over a longer period of time. But unfortunately, we have this commitment. The other thing that I think perhaps that needs a little bit more realism is this whole question of heat. I mean, gas is not only the largest source of energy in the economy at the moment, but it is the dominant source of heat. 80% of our homes are heated by gas. Very large parts of industry and commerce are heated by gas. So there's this huge infrastructure there already. Now, in the 2050 pathways, part of the proposal is to switch to renewable heat, which is things like heat pumps, 
um, which on a big scale have not been installed. I mean, there are plenty of small scale installations, but on a really big sort of countrywide scale, it's not been done before. Um, and electricity. But that means decarbonizing electricity because, I mean, modern gas boilers, you know, are up in the 75, 80, 80 plus percent efficient already. And not everybody has switched to modern gas fired boilers, but they've got a boiler. But in the course of time, you know, the, the general change in stock, there will be more and more will switch. So we think there's a much more to go in that area. The other area where there's more to go is, as Simon mentioned, there's a huge amount of power generating plants going to be closed over the next 15 years. Lots and lots of coal, the remaining oil, and a lot of nuclear. Now, frankly, if you want to keep the lights on and make it affordable, looking certainly on at least a 10 and probably a 15 year time frame, our firm belief is, and some of you would say, well, you chaps would say this, wouldn't you? But our firm belief is, gas-fired power is the only technology which is going to do it. It's available now, we know it works, it's available at scale, and it's affordable. It's the cheapest to build by far, and it has the least contention around it in terms of planning, space, and all the things that go with it. If you switch out of existing coal into gas, for the same amount of electricity, emissions of CO2 are more than halved. And you don't have worries about some of the other pollutants like oxides of sulfur, oxides of nitrogen, because it's well within the limits. So it has huge advantages. And, and we think that it is absolutely inevitable that we're going to keep the lights on. That is the direction in which we're going to have to go. And as far as all those other policies are concerned about renewable heat, uh, uh, renewable uh, 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 electricity and so on, we ought to think on a fresh <coughs> time scale. Uh, we realize that this actually means going back to Europe and saying, hey fellas, just let's take stock. Is this affordable? Can it actually be done? Because we don't believe it can. And we're publishing us the results of a study this Wednesday, which has been looking at this for us. Not a study that we have done, we got it commissioned by uh, external experts. Um, and I can tell you that the results of that study raise huge question marks on this whole question of affordability and deliverability. And certainly, if we want to keep the lights on, we want to keep the com economy competitive, and we want to make sure that individuals can afford their fuel, as well as cut emissions, we can only see one route in the, certainly the 10 to 15 year time frame. And in the longer term, if carbon capture and storage does come, come good, there's absolutely no reason why it can't be applied to uh, gas-fired power just as it can be applied to coal-fired power. So we wait on that technology. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Dr. Doug Parr, who's Chief Scientist and Policy Director of Greenpeace UK. While he's worked on a range of topics, including GM crops and nuclear power in the past, he's currently focusing on climate change policy. Good. Uh, thank you, Simon. Um, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk here about the. Uh, uh, well, I was going to say the, the challenge of keeping the lights on. I actually don't think that's an issue, frankly. Um, the lights are going to stay on. The question is how. Um, because there's certainly a, 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 a lot of electricity generation capacity going to close over the next decade. There's also a huge amount in uh, consented under construction or uh, in the planning system. <coughs> it is predominantly gas-fired power stone, gas-fired power, and a certain amount of renewables. So will the lights stay on? Yes. Do we face an energy gap? No, uh, but how are we going to manage the consequences of the current market system, which makes the default that option gas under almost all circumstances? Because as David correctly says, it's cheap and it's pretty much available, despite all the scaremongering under the previous government uh, to frighten us always having nuclear power. Gas is actually uh, pretty available. 
the issue, therefore, is not about um, gas supplies, and as Simon's note here about the, uh, the issues, what, what are the implications of shale gas? Well, the implication of shale gas is there's even more gas swilling around on the international markets than, uh, than there was a couple of years ago. Um, the issue is, therefore, how do we deal with the consequences? What are the dangers? What are the issues? One is longer term security. If we become very, very heavily dependent on gas, even more than we are already, um, then there may come a point in the future where we have a, have, a, have a swap out issue. We're heavily dependent on it for electricity, we're heavily dependent on it for uh, heating. That's not in the immediate future. That's, again, a long term issue. The other long term issue is uh, what uh, David King, former chief scientist and now at Oxford University, characterised as high carbon stranded assets. If one adopts the targets that we have. Uh, got for ourselves and have been uh, uh, proposed and sort of kind of accepted by government but not really uh, on decarbonisation of the electricity supply, then um, unabated gas-fired power, station gas power stations in volume is not going to meet those targets. The electricity, the electricity system is tremendously important. I'll come on to heat in a moment because I'll <coughs> A few words to say about that. The electricity system is tremendously important because, both in terms of running of the economy, but also in terms of the long term decarbonisation of the UK as an economy, and let's face it, if we're looking at our international role in climate change, demonstrating a high, car uh, high carbon move to a low carbon economy whilst remaining prosperous is practically the only thing you we can do. We're not going to mediate between the US and China and India, uh, or between the, the so-called BRIC states, including Brazil and South Africa and so on. We, we've lost that opportunity if we ever had it. We've got to make ourselves a good low-carbon economy, profitable low-carbon economy, exporting um, uh, low-carbon goods and, uh, and playing a big role of being influential in the EU to get the EU to retain leadership. So that's just a little code there about what role we need to play. Now, High carbon stranded assets are where the strength of climate policy means that, the, means that the kit you've got is no longer fit for purpose. Um, an example actually would be Heathrow Airport Third Runway. Uh, the, amount of, uh, the amount of carbon that will be generated by a third runway, when you start to see the, uh, the trajectories for uh, CO2 emissions cuts that need to, be, uh, need to be made, it's very difficult to see how under almost all, all, all uh, scenarios, one could have a, a big expansion of traffic of the sort envisaged by BAA and still operate the third runway um, of that full capacity. <coughs> this applies also to unabated gas pipe power stations. And so the, uh, the challenge is to, uh, as so often in the political system, is to lift one's eyes away from the short-term easy option and aim for the uh, for kit and infrastructure that is going to be good for the long term. Because what is, uh, what is cheapest in the short term is not always uh, best for us in the long term. It was very cheap and easy to throw up bog standard houses uh, of very low thermal performance a long time ago. Is anybody grateful for that now? Are we so prosperous that we can manage the consequences of this uh, jerry-built stuff um, with thermal performance lower than almost any other country in Europe? Well, no, it's a huge bloody problem. We're far worse than anywhere else in Europe on the, on, in terms of thermal performance of our houses. Um, so, um, we believe that the the way forward in the immediate future is to um, attack those targets that have been uh, pushed to us from Europe. Um, let's remember Tony Blair was very instrumental in making it happen. Um, so it's if it's we've got a problem, it's kind of our fault. Um, our anal the analysis that uh, was done by uh, Poirier, who one or two of you may have heard of there, uh, they style themselves Europe's leading energy consultancy, and they might, be, might even be right. Um, said that if the UK uh, meets its renewable energy targets and its energy efficiency targets, 
then the need for uh, new thermal capacity between now and 2020 is uh, practically non-existent. And that was before the recession. That analysis was done in 2007. So um, post-recession, where, uh, where power demand has dropped off significantly, um, we think that, um, that that's the way we should go. Now, in terms of, um, in terms of building out uh, renewable energy, uh, particularly offshore wind, because that's where so much of it's going to go, I don't deny that's a huge engineering challenge. On the other hand, the, uh, the rate of installation is very comparable to the rate that, uh, that Germany has managed over the past, uh, over the past decade, uh, decade and a half. Um, and the, the, uh, the rate of increase of, uh, of installation is, is, is also very similar. It's point the Climate Change Committee, who are the statutory advisors to government on this issue, make, make very forcefully. So, um, no question, very challenging, very difficult, but not impossible, because it's already been done. Um, by another uh, nation not a million miles from here. Um, let me just say then about, uh, about heat, because as I say, the, uh, and uh, David is quite right to point to, the, uh, point to heat as uh, a bit of an issue. Uh, something like 49% of our energy needs are for heat. So any proper energy policy has got to look at heat and the overlaps between um, between the heat and electricity systems. Um, it's always struck me as a bit odd, particularly odd under the previous government, when uh, they were talking about nuclear as a way of managing, uh, managing our gas dependency. If they were serious about that, um, even, even with, our, with our large number of gas by power stations, we find that uh, we still use more gas for heating than we do for uh, electricity generation. If we were serious about gas security, we'd have a emergency loft lagging program. House insulation should be a national security issue uh, about making sure that we, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't import as much as we, uh, as we otherwise do. Now that's not happening and therefore it's a bit, it actually doesn't strike me as terribly credible to be saying we've got to have a new nuclear which is going to take still nearly a decade. I don't believe 2018 by the way is going to be after 2020 if we get a nuclear. Um, that, um, that that whole housing stock <coughs> issue that I referred to earlier needs, uh, needs a lot more attention, a lot more political will, and a lot more creativity in developing the investment to go into it. Uh, we're not convinced about the Green New Deal at the moment, maybe we can say a little bit more about that later. So, in summary then, because I'm probably exceeding my timetable, um, the, the issues that we face on the electricity system are about what kind of infrastructure do we want in the long term. <clears throat> Gas is undoubtedly going to play a significant role. But we cannot meet our targets um, in terms of uh, and, and demonstrate leadership globally by building lots and lots of gas. We have got to find a way of delivering on the renewable targets, particularly delivering on the efficiency targets unfortunately quite a lot of leaders sit in Europe for that. And making sure that our, our gas dependency remains small and uh, that we find ways of, uh, of integrating the heat and electricity systems to minimise emissions at the same time. Thank you. Right, three good sets of remarks. Um, and uh, <coughs> disagreement, so that's, that's, that's a good basis for us to have some discussion. Now, um, I'm going to take questions. Could you say your name and your organisation uh, and then answer the question? Start here. Thank you, Simon. Um, Jeff Chapman, Carbon Capture and Storage Association. Uh, just clear up one thing to begin with, and Andrew and David, there's no if in whether CCS will, will deliver. Um, that's uh, it's going to deliver, and that's that. We're, we're, we're going to be absolutely stuffed if it, if it doesn't. Uh, so let's get rid of that if. Um, that, but the, the, my point really, just to take something up with David, is um, uh, we are here to talk about keeping the lights on, and and, uh, and, and I'm, I'm agnostic as to as, as to what fuel we use to do that. Um, but I, I would like to, uh, to redress the balance a little bit in favour of coal because the one thing coal has got, uh, apart from very high emissions which we can deal with, 
um, is that is that uh, it's got a, a, a benefit in terms of energy energy storage. There is no better energy store than a socking great big pile of coal. And um, and in terms of keeping the lights on, coal has a strategic place in 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 our energy mix. I think it's complementary to gas and it's complementary to, to to all the rest. And of course, we need every every. every 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 component of, uh, in, in in our energy mix, um, but there is a sort of strategic play for coal as well as gas. Uh, should we take one more question? Yeah. And then we'll around. Um, Richard Tever, East and Brighton Liberals, um, retired observer, commentator. Um, firstly, a comment, if I may, the incoming president of the Institute of Engineering and Technology is delivering a presidential address, I think on October the 7th at Savoy Place, on this identical subject. People have got space in their diary for that. Secondly, a general question. The, the previous government made much store of saying how they passed the legislation about legally binding targets, as though by passing that legislation it solved everything, rather like can you telling the waves to go back. Uh, my question, and I haven't had a, an up, well, I've had an answer elsewhere. We're interested to know what the panel thinks is. Should we fail to meet those targets? Who, pay, who penalises whom and how? <laughs> oh, well, thank you. I, I'm not sure. I mean, the answer to the, to the, uh, to the last question is I, I don't know. I'd have to go back to the legislation and find out who's imprisoned and uh, what, what fine is attached to them at the time. They probably would have done. Um, well, to put it on my address, I, I asked the question of Lord Stern, and he said it's merely words, dear boy. I know exactly, quite. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's really meaningless. And uh, it's, <clears throat> it's set it such a target level in any case, it, it is out with the political cycle. So if, it, if you, couldn't, you, couldn't, um, you couldn't sanction a, a, a Secretary of State unless they happen to, unless they happen to be very um, um, extraordinarily long-lived and and retain both their seats and, and, and stay in government for a very long time, which is, of course, uh, rare. Um, um, so, 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 so it's it's a rhetorical question, and one which I I, um, I I entirely accept the 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 you know the point being made under uh, you know below it. And I think that a lot of um, to a certain extent target setting is useful because it, it helps to concentrate minds. But on the other hand. Um, in, inflating them to a level of, of legally binding um, is, is, is a lot of poppycock, I agree. With regard to the question about carbon capture and storage, I am very pleased to hear, um, and I think that, that, uh, that Chris Hume uh, has also heard um, the confidence coming from, from that section of the industry, which I think is, 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 um, is reassuring. Um, and obviously, we'll, we'll we, um, wait to see how, how things proceed from here. And certainly, as far as as far as the options available to the to the government, if 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 your confidence can be can be if you like demonstrated with uh, with um, the actual projects, deliverable projects on the ground, then that's something which I, I I'm sure that the department will feel uh, much reassured about. And uh, I mean, with regard to your comments about coal versus gas and the the merits of that, I will allow David to, uh, to, to address those issues. Uh, yeah, Jeff, uh, of course. Um, I mean, I'm an engineer by training, even if I've forgotten most of it. Um, <coughs> technically, I don't doubt it can be done. The bits are all there, but nobody's ever integrated it at full power station scale yet, anywhere. It's going to be expensive, though. That's the crucial point. And it's going to take time. And that's the second crucial point. And at the moment, we ain't got the luxury of lots of money and lots of time. Because the electricity system has got to have quite a lot of change in it, as we say, I've been talking about it, in the 10 to 15 year time frame. Now, in the fullness of time, I believe it'll come. But I don't think it'll come before 2025 to 2030. That's my view in commercial scale. And frankly, I don't care tons whether it's applied to coal or it's applied to gas. I just, the reason I was emphasizing applied gas is that all the literature you read coming out of government talks about coal with carbon capture and storage. It hardly ever mentions gas with carbon capture and storage. 
So, in my view, there's room for both, but it's going to have to prove itself commercially, and that's where I think the difficulty lies, and it's going to take time. Technically, I'm sure it can be done. We'll always crack these kind of problems, we always do, eventually. But people's ambitions tend to run ahead of what is deliverable practically. To pick up the other one, yeah, you're quite right. I mean, we wrote in our 2009 economic report, it is far from clear whom these targets will bind. And, and you know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a lovely idea, it's a lovely concept, and of course it does help focus minds. At least that's one thing, to give people a clear signal that that's the direction in which we're trying to head. And in that sense, that's very helpful. And I think the other thing is, although 2050 is yonks away, that's 40 years away, and goodness knows, if you go back 40 years, could we have predicted what, where we are today? At least it gives you some sort of sense of direction. The problem child, I think, is in some of the 2020 targets, which is what I was talking about. And there, I think, we do have a problem, and that's why we really need to think about some of those. Right. Um, yes, I'm, uh, I'm with David on some of this, actually. I'm, I'm not quite as bullish about CCS as you are, Jeff, as you probably know. Um, <laughs> And uh, I, I, I also don't doubt it will, it will work in the sense that, you know, you capture carbon dioxide, you pipe it, you can pump it under the ground, and that's all been done. Uh, the, the question is, what proportion of capture on a power station, and will it all fit together well, and at what cost? And I think that's, that's, uh, that's something that we still don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, if we believe the nuclear power industry, for example, then, you know, we would be too cheap to meet it, wouldn't it? So, uh, and we're clearly not there. Um, but just on the uh, on the, the legally binding targets thing, yeah, I mean, there, there is no, I mean, who's, nobody's gonna go to prison over it, are they? But I don't think one should therefore say that they're not, they're not important. Um, partly as a declaration of intent, but hell, you know, you can get lots of declarations of intent from politicians and that's fine. Uh, and they, they unpick at the next government. But if it's in, if it's in law, um, then the challenge for not meeting it is more significant politically. And also, do not underplay the significance of what that uh, act spawned in terms of carbon budgets for individual departments, the climate change committee that is producing independent evidence of government's performance, monitoring, evaluation, snapping at their heels is appropriate, and also, um, bluntly, something to beat civil servants with if they're not falling into line. Uh, and that has changed, that has produced a change of mindset in key parts of government who were otherwise inclined to just say, oh yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm not interested in those targets, not interested in these declarations. It's legally binding, mate. you know, you permanent secretary have got to go away and deliver me a plan as to how this is going to happen. And uh, so its significance is not in that, um, you know, uh, Chris Hume is expecting to be locked up if things don't work out. Its significance is, is on the change, of, the change of culture that it uh, imparts and the, uh, the change of, uh, of focus on, uh, on what needs to happen and how it needs to happen and, and the cost of effectiveness. Great. Another question? Yes. It's quite a big one. In talking about energy demand, yes. oh, sorry, under producing care, I'm a, I was kind of down in north with the general election. Um, we talk about electricity demand, we need to factor in the fact that we're trying to move people away from higher carbon, higher carbon energy goals in other areas, such as electric cars, going for um, um, heat pumps and that sort of thing, it's adding to the electricity demand. So we've got a, a growth in electricity at the same time as reduction in uh, the desire to be using carbon and fossil fuels, all that. The um, other countries have been looking at energy availability as a national security issue. Germany and the US have done uh, reports, major reports recently. And there was some rumour in The Guardian that DEF has done a similar report which hasn't been published publicly. Um, I don't know whether um, Andrew, you know anything about that. But if not, it's obviously something that's I think you could talk about and people can find out about. But the, the bigger picture of this is why are we investing 
we shouldn't we be investing now for that long term? We know the fossil fuels are finite. Whether we've got peak oil four years ago or five years from now is fairly arbitrary. We know gas is a finite resource, a lot of it's now coming from Russia. That's clearly a national security issue. Um, in my book, from a government perspective, even if it's not from that, an energy producer's perspective. Um, you know, um, coal again, we have a project. We're not secure on our energy resources, but we could be for renewables. If we invest in renewables now, then we've got long-term security. If we go part way into different sources of fossil fuel generation, are we investing in something that we actually need to be throwing away or, or, or the time expired in the 20, 40 years' time, we'll, be, we'll still be in the same position as we're talking about. Okay, I'll take one more question. I wanted to return to the common, common substrations. And it strikes me that, um, well, first, I think this has been pointed out, the long term goal really is zero emissions. Um, but um, what is an achievable target for CTS? About 200 grams per kilowatt hour, something like that, or is it a little bit less than that? That's 20, at least 10 times what you're going to get out of your own and we're looking at something like five. Yeah. Um, the second issue, I think, is in terms of carbon sequestration. One policy is that I don't think we've really talked about is in terms of replacing housing stock, like wooden houses. My house has been storing carbon for about 400 years. Uh, <laughs> I don't see why we shouldn't be building wooden houses in terms of addressing some of the thermal efficiency of the housing stock as well. Um, such a matter. Should we go in reverse order this time? Mm, sure. Um, National security issue, yes, um, agree that, uh, <coughs> I mean, I think, I think DEC are producing something on, uh, on security. Uh, they take quite a long time to produce it because I spoke to the civil servants quite a while ago about it. And actually I said, uh, I said oil was a bigger security issue than gas, but I don't know what they're going to say when I think about that, or what they're going to say about it. Um, but I do agree that, um, you know, if you... If you think peak oil is uh, is coming, the strategic response needs to be the same, whether it's uh, three years, five years, or ten years away, um, which is to uh, change the demand profile for oil uh, and bear down on it. Um, we're in a better, and curiously, we are in a slightly better state than a lot of uh, a lot of European countries because we don't use as much oil for heating as they do. Um, but it does emphasise for us our dependency on oil in the transport sector, and we believe that. Um, the efficiency standards for cars need to be at a European level tightened as far as possible, and we need to be preparing for a switch out into electric, which ain't going to happen to any significant degree over the next decade. Um, but the long term seems to be the uh, only available option, and there is a lot that can be done now. And bluntly, um, we are in, the, in a pack of countries that are at leading on electric vehicles. Uh, alongside, well, California is really a country, but there's California, there's China, there's the, there's the UK, um, and, uh, um, and there's a couple of others in Europe who's, I can't remember, and they start to be deployed in Israel and Denmark. So there's a few who are ahead, and if we get our act together, then we can build on what we've got in, in, in Sunderland and actually get a, uh, get a thriving um, manufacturing business uh, sector out of it. Anyway, uh, on the CCS target, uh, well, Jeff can tell us, my understanding is that um, our CCS target of, uh, on coal should be possible to get under 100 grams per kilowatt hour. Um, that would be my expectation, if it works as well as components expect. Have that caveat in there. And you're quite right about wooden houses in the sense that you get a lot better um, I think the life cycle analysis shows that wooden houses are the best way of uh, using wood to um, or get the best returns in terms of uh, carbon emissions. Um, I think the, the issue there is, uh, is supply and quality and the ancillary things that have to be done around the house and whether the, 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 the scale is possible to deliver on. Yes, well thank you. Well, we pick up on that first question. I, I, I don't think I disagree with you. I think it's just an emphasis, a question of timing, though. Um, the, the, the energy system is going to be reshaped. There's no question over the next 40 years. The, the, the difficulty we have is the rush at the moment is not going to be delivered and is extremely expensive. 
So it needs to be spaced out more, give time. But I mean, Doug said the Germans have built uh, wind at that rate. Well, that may be true onshore. It's not been done offshore. And offshore is hugely more problematic, as we know as an industry. I can tell you, operating up there is very, very different from having your feet planted on terra firma. It's much more expensive, and it is much, much more restrictive. The, wet, the wind and the, wet and the sea prevents access a, a lot of the time. And, and obviously, the atmospheric conditions are extremely hostile, so plant deteriorates very fast. So, sorry, Doug, I don't agree with you there. The, 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 the challenge offshore is hugely greater than what the Germans have done. Hugely greater. Come back to the original question, though. Uh, yeah, plant built today is going to have to be renewed anyway by the middle of the century. Except perhaps new nuke because they're probably going to last at least 50 or 60 years. So there is a natural churn in the capital stock, which will be there in any event. And, and what worries us is that this rush, however well-intentioned, and we don't attempt to say it isn't well-intentioned, because it is, however well-intentioned, actually is putting enormous pressures in a short time frame, which the economy cannot absorb. And we need to spread these things out over a longer time frame and get more of a rolling program rather than a huge mountainous program in a 10 to 15 year time frame. That's really where we're coming from. And also, that will give time for new technologies to be worked on and developed. And some of them will be discarded because they won't work. But others we probably haven't even thought of will come through and start to work. So, it, it, it's trying to get the freneticness out of it, frankly, which is very, very expensive and is going to do a lot of damage in our view. Yeah, um, I, I, I think that sometimes when we're talking about security of supply, um, there is a, a potential confusion between self-sufficiency and security. I mean, in the sense that over the last um, the 30 years, the UK has been a net primarily, over most of that period, a net ex exporter. Uh, we, don't, we don't consume all of the energy that we, we produce. We export quite a lot, um, and we import quite a, quite a lot, and that will continue, uh, I, I think, for some, for some time, for as long as we, we manage to find some bit of more oil and, and, and gas. And there will be a lot on the, on the coal front coming. Um, but with regard to the issue of of, uh, of security, I don't think that we'll ever be self-sufficient, and I think that that it's it's some it, it's some it's it's. I mean, w whilst there isn't you know an attraction, I think to try and become as self-sufficient, of course, as it's possible to be. I think you have to be realistic that that to to take a, a, a you know almost an energy isolationist approach is not necessarily wise, and that and that and that there is you know there is a global market in energy, and that. You know, it's inevitable that we will be sourcing substantial um, energy um, um, ex externally. Um, I mean, what at the end of the day, the you know a government is 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 responsible for is to ensure that 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 that, that, that uh, secure, clean, uh, and affordable energy is available um, to people so that people have light, warm, um, <coughs> uh, or rather warmth um, when they. When they when they need it, and that and that's the, the primary objective of um, of any of any government to uh, to to achieve. And, and the present government has has, um, has said that its its program um, sees a range of mechanisms, such as the, the renewable obligation certificate, speed and tariffs emission, performance standard, carbon price floor, which of course will be introduced in time, um, and other other mechanisms to help to help deliver that as a as a you know, as a policy, but I think it's one which it's going to be difficult to to see um, how we can uh, have absolutes in, in the you know in this in this particular case. I mean, clearly we need to be generating as much of our own as we, as we can. I agree with with Doug that, um, as I understand it, the development of uh, of electric um, you know cars, for example, you know, the, the transport is one which is clearly an area of 
uh, you know, technological development which, which we need to watch and make sure that um, the UK is to the fore in areas like that where we think that that's going to make a significant contribution uh, to, um, to, to security of energy in, in, this, um, in this country. The other, the other question is also a technological about, about energy efficiency and whilst, whilst um, the previous government introduced um, some of it, I have to say, through uh, a private member's bill, which was, I think, introduced by, by, Andrew, uh, by Andrew Stunnell origi originally. Um, the, the, there, are, there are energy performance standard certificates which now need to apply to improve the energy efficiency of new buildings, but not the, 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 the old. 